everybody. Welcome to Friday p.m. It's Luigi Scarcelli here. We're going to be doing something a little different this weekend. Uh, instead of being in live in the studio, I'm up here in Bar Harbor, Maine. You can see the great scenery around me. Uh, we're going to be talking to Skip at the Tool Barn. He's a great guy. It's world famous. We're going to be talking to the folks at the Seal Cove Auto Museum. Uh, and we're also going to hear some music from Buck Edwards, a great musician. That's back in Portland at Coppersmith. But stick with us. It's going to be a great show. We're happy to have you here. Thanks again. Uh, we are very happy to be here at the Seal Cove Auto Museum. Yes. Uh, with Ethan Yankura. Yankura. Yes. Yankura. Good to see you, mm -hmm. Ethan. Wow. All right. Great to see you. Uh, so I was here for a birthday party before. I was blown away. I didn't even know this existed. Uh, Seal Cove, and it's got cars from everywhere. We're going to be taking a look at a lot of these cars in a minute or two. But we want to kind of learn a little bit more about the history of the place, uh, how it was started, and you seem to be the guy that knows everything about it. I know a few things. Okay, okay. Um, so where, when, when did this, you said, you said it was 60 years ago? So this 2023 is our 60th anniversary. We were incorporated by our founder, Richard C. Payne Jr. in 1963. Uh, it was founded as a private foundation, and he was uh, one of those indiscriminate collectors. Uh, he, he really had a focus for the mechanical, but it was automobiles, there were motorcycles, cash registers, Victrolas, cigar store, Indians. Uh, there was a little bit of everything in here. And it was it was quite a quite an operation for, for many years. And when he passed away in 2007, um, there was a decision to be made. I, I kind of look at it as the story of two museums. There was the museum when Richard was alive, and then after his his passing, uh, a decision had to be made. And his wishes were that a, a large number of the automobiles and, and engines and ephemera would be sold to create an endowment to help support the collection that you see in the museum today. So. Uh, he, he had established this while he was living, and then the museum reformulated and became its own entity and have been doing so since 2008. Okay. And so originally this was, it was a full museum of a lot of things, not just auto, automobiles. Right. And so what you're saying is, is that he sold some of the, just to be able to, at a really good like markup, I assume it was. It was actually through an auction at Bonham's. Um, okay, uh, here in the state of Maine, I was, I was lucky enough to actually be a part of the auction. Uh, I had never seen the collection in its entirety yeah. as as Richard had assembled it. Yeah, um, but I've seen it that at auction and that that's remained here. But uh, he 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 traded cars. It was it was a lot of. Fun. So just to delve back to this gentleman, like what year was he born and what was his story a little bit? Oh, it's the year he was born, I, I would have Hard to say, yeah, right? but he was... To look that up. But, but he, um, yeah. But he, he was a, a lifelong collector. Um, in fact, the, what is now a storage facility down the street about a half a mile is, uh, was originally his Saab dealership. Okay. He was one of the first, if not the first, dealer in, in Saab automobiles in the state of Maine. And they were pretty popular for a long time. You don't see as many Saabs anymore, but they, no. one time in the 80s and 90s, that was the kind of the hot new car. Yes. Um, so he starts it out. It, it's kind of evolved now. Let's talk a little bit about kind of like what are some of the signature cars? Do you guys focus on cars of different generations? Is it? So the focus of the museum is what's referred to as the brass era of the automobile. And that's roughly 1895 to 1917. Um, and it's really indicated, the name itself kind of tells you what, what you'll be looking at, but there was a transition in 1916, 1917, where the headlamps and the trim and, and the horns had been brass, and then they transitioned with nickel. So you'll often see brass and nickel combined when you're talking about a certain period of automobiles. But by and large, what you see here in the museum is pre-1917. There are a few um, examples that deviate from that. The, 19, the Model A right behind us yeah, is right one example that falls outside that category. But we really like to look at the, the foundation of the automobile. 
And more importantly, the vast majority of the vehicles in the museum are American, built in the Northeast and in New England. And so, a um, couple questions on that. Number one, do you guys are you guys still acquiring automobiles? Like, yes, we actually in in 2022, the museum made the commitment to actually start an endowment fund toward acquisitions. That was that. That's that endowment. Okay. And, anyway. Well, we started our own fund. Okay. It was something that we we took on ourselves, and we felt it was important to be able to acquire vehicles. Um, we actually took in a vehicle on loan this morning, uh, 1906 Wayne, which is a beautiful little uh, two-place runabout, two-cylinder, horizontally opposed, uh, 1906. So you'll see many vehicles are on loan from individuals around the museum's collection. And that was what I was going to ask you was that you, you're, you know, obviously not that you wouldn't want to own all these, but a lot of them are on loan from collectors and they like to have just like a museum of art would have a lot of times. That's great. Okay, interesting. And we're just kind of in the general viewpoint of cars of that era where these uh, to have a car in those days was very unique, wasn't it? I mean, this was not something everybody had. That's right. And the, one of the exhibitions that our visitors will see uh, takes a look at a period on Mount Desert Island history that was known as the Auto Wars. Okay. And it, in the early years of the 20th century, there was actually a ban of, of automobiles on the island. Right. There were a couple of towns and villages that would allow them. But it was actually something that if, if you go digging through newspapers uh, across the country, you find stories about this this war that a small island in Maine was having against the Otter here. Then that was people that were against this progress or what it was doing, or maybe it was probably had more to do with the roads, maybe, that and they didn't was, like this carbon. That material. was part of it. There was a, there was a large influence uh, with the carriage trails in Acadia yeah. National Park yeah. and yeah. keeping things pristine sure. and yeah. automobiles were a big disruption in the early 20th century. So, I mean, in, in those days, they probably, I mean, as we all know from like Walden and things, there, there was environmentalists in those days who probably saw cars as very polluting because they didn't like the, I mean, you could just see what a car would do, especially in those days, right. probably churn and smoke out everywhere. Other than the electric cars that they seem to have had in those days, yes. Uh, but they probably noise pollution, just the, the quality of life they right. didn't like. Yeah. So that was an auto wars. Is that something that people can look up? So it's probably somewhere on. If there. it it is, and like I said, it's it's part of the installation installation that we here this year. So our user will be able to see that story along with several others. And so, speaking of which, uh, you had a couple of things that you you told me about that were coming up: the vacation land installation, some things. Yeah. Just so that we can uh, explain to the the viewers who probably will come down here, like w what's going on with all of that a little bit. Okay, so as as part of our 60th anniversary celebration, uh, we decided rather than one large exhibition, we wanted to take a sort of a retrospective look at some of the work that has been presented at the museum before. Auto Wars has each each of the exhibitions that we presented, uh, with one exception, have been full blown wide installations and we pared them down and ordered the museum so you get a little taste of previous exhibitions auto wars is one of them uh, another is engines of change which is a celebration of the centennial of the 19th amendment which was the women's right to vote um, that exhibition was launched in 2020 which coincided with the centennial of the 19th amendment but unfortunately it also coincided with the outbreak of COVID nineteen. So I remember, yeah, it was something that might not have gotten as much exposure as it otherwise would have. But uh, it's a it's a great look at how the automobile and motorized transportation played a part in assisting women in spreading the word in getting the vote up and earning. Them. We also have uh, art and advertising, which is a look at. The early advertising art that went along with one of the vehicles and the artists who created it. And the final component is the new element is becoming vacation land. Right. And that in the coming year, uh, for 2024, that will become a museum wide installation. And that will really look at the role that the, the automobile played in transforming the landscape of Maine and how we how we became vacation land from the 
main publicity bureau, the Grand Hotels, and then the advent of the motel, you know, kind of as people began traveling on their own in their own vehicles rather than arriving by train or steamship. So it really will we'll dive into how this this landscape of Maine was changed, but also facilitated in becoming more accessible uh, through the use of personal transportation. Well, it's interesting in, in, a, in a couple of ways. I mean, that's kind of like where other parts of the country, maybe the railways, that was integral. And then, you know, but this Maine was really expansive due to, I mean, it, not, there probably was some train type of things, but but that's not exactly, that's what created that was, and so was it does it coincide really historically, you know, bit by bit with, you know, automobiles became more affordable, you know, fa you know, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, prior to the to the twentieth century, most visitors who arrived in Maine, they did come by train, they came by steamship, and we have all of these wonderful stories. The the depot hack, which a lot of people see as it, it looks like a station wagon. And depot hack and station wagon, those two terms are are integral to each other, and they harken back to that period where when you arrived at whatever your destination was by train, that was the depot, and a hack was a taxi. So the depot hack would take you from the train station to your hotel or whatever your final destination was. And that became kind of a like a prototype to the station and, wagon. And yeah. then the station wagon was took that a, idea and a yeah. derivation. Yeah, yeah. Instead of the train depot, you have the train station. Right, right. And that's I mean, it does seem as though if you looked at more of the well to do people that were able to come here in the early, early days, they probably didn't have the big families. You know, the working class folks maybe had the bigger families. How do how do people get here? And that became the onset and, and were the, the highways and the new roads, was that all coming along at the same time? That was a big part of it. The, the foundation of the Maine Publicity Bureau was hand in hand with the Maine right. Bureau Association. And uh, I won't spoil the story. Yeah, exactly, right exactly. But the way they intertwine is, it's really fascinating how it was, they were, the roads in Maine were, were really miserable in the right, right, right. Like century. And there weren't a whole lot of them. So as roads improved, as cars became more affordable and more available, there's, there's, it's, I don't look at it as a chicken or an egg. I look at it as a circle. As it's, one big thing. There are points around this circle that you couldn't have the circle unless they all existed. All came together. Um, so if you could tell the audience uh, how, how they, the dates they can come here, the days sure. of the week, how to get here. I was going to say how to get here, but you kind of got to figure it out on your own. I don't know if you could tell them that much. Sure. <laughs> uh, it, it's not as difficult to get here right. as it's not. make it out to me. Sure. But um, uh, you can find a, uh, directions to the museum on our website. On the website. SealCoveAutomuseum.org. Yep. Right here. Yep. We are open seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. from May 1st until October 31st. Throughout the season, we have cars and coffee events on Saturdays. Find all of this information on our website, website. and on our Facebook page. Uh, this weekend, we have our Woody's Wagons Cars and Coffee, so that gives me a chance to break out the depot hack and talk a little bit about that. Right. Um, so we have our, our big barbecue is the name of the event. We'll have three bands, food trucks, Car show. It's a great event, fun for the whole family. Uh, definitely something that people will want to miss. So August fifth, uh, twenty twenty three. Check that out. Like you said, it's August fifth, twenty three. August fifth, August twenty three. Uh, and then, aren't you doing also the driving the cars around on Tuesdays? I saw that in the newspaper. On Mondays, we have Monday Mondays. Orders. Yep, Monday and orders. That's between one and two thirty. We we like to pick times eleven and two or. or Nice, but when we have a nice audience at the museum. Um, when it's not raining outside. When it it's not raining, we'll exactly. take something from the collection that, that runs. It was raining yesterday, uh, which was a Monday, and they actually did the demonstration in the in the auto workshop. So we're not 100% weather permitting, but we, if it's something that we want to drive around, we try, try. That, that the weather's good. And that's Mondays. 
Well, we're going to take a look around and see some more with uh, the Seal Cove Auto Museum. So stick with us. Thanks. Weltering hot cars, the choking dust and exhaust, the shivering in zero cold. With all-season air conditioning, you simply turn one knob to ride cool in summer, warm in winter, and enjoy filtered fresh air in any weather all year round. Own a spectacular new Rambler with complete year-round air conditioning. It's the lowest-priced air-conditioned car in America. Yes, low-cost all-season air conditioning is the right kind for you, and you're so right to choose the 55 Rambler Cross Country, now at all Nash dealers, with all the glamour of a luxurious family sedan plus the utility of a rugged station wagon. Another reason why American Motors means more for America. And now a word from our alternate sponsor, your dependable Dodge dealer. So I was wondering, Ethan, uh, do all of the, the automobiles here actually run or? Unfortunately, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. But but a, a good number of them do. Yep. Um, if if you look around, you'll I can see some legs sticking out from underneath the 1914 Stanley Mountain Wagon. Yeah, there's definitely it's some. It's a Stanley there. steam car. Uh, yep. It's great to see something under steam operating. But we do have a good number of cars that, that run. That actually run. Um, and you, you probably have something that stands out as like your most unique piece. I think when I was here before, there are some some cars that not only, I mean, automotively are they really unique, their history is really unique. And I remember there was one or two of those. And and we actually do have a few vehicles that are the definition of unique. They are the only one of their only kind one, in, yeah. in, in the world. Um, That's unique. And I can think of two of those right now that are in running condition. Wow. And uh, I always tell people, uh, if you ask me what my favorite car is, it's a, it's a little bit like having multiple children, and it's the one that you're, you're my favorite today. Oh, no, exactly. really, right, right, right. He's, he's not my favorite. But right. it depends on what you're working with and what you're doing research on, that, that everything here is fascinating in its own way, whether it's historically, mechanically, there's there's something behind just about every hand. And that... Was there any one car that was also, I think it was most of what you said about women's suffrage. A lot of the, they were really tied to that historically. We actually have a vehicle. It's, it's, uh, a, it's a 1916 Saxon that is a representation of a car that was driven by two women, uh, not just across the country, but around the four corners of the country. I think they drove over 10,000 miles. Uh, Alice and Nell were their names, and we have a, a representative Saxon that's painted up to look like their car. It has the stenciling on the doors that show the city and town, the major cities that they visited. Uh, and it's also a great piece in that we can let kids and families get in the car and has their pictures taken with supervision. So it gives people a little bit of a sense, even if it's only for a few moments, what it was like to be in one of these cars, uh, let alone for 10,000 miles. 10,000 miles. Most of and I think the one other question with that, uh, for all of the kind of uh, the under the hood junkies out there, uh, do you guys have guys that fix these here? Or? We do. I mentioned our volunteers, but yep. we also have a senior mechanic on staff who is wonderful he's a, he's a great teacher okay uh, um, he's not just a, not just a mechanic but he does a wonderful work with the volunteers in shepherding them through the process of, of working on these vehicles so it's as much a learning environment as it is a mechanical and, and a shop excellent excellent well i want to thank you very much ethan for taking the time out we'll be right back after this Commonplace occurrences of day-to-day -day living. 
one thing stands out as a completely unique experience. Colt 45 Malt Liquor. Hey everybody, we're back here at Friday PM. I'm here with Skip, who is the proprietor of the Tool Barn, super well-known Hulls Cove. It's been here forever. Any tool you wanna find, you can find it here with Skip at the Tool Barn. This place is great. Uh, we're gonna be showing some photos and yeah. video that we took walking around. Um, I know you're also in Liberty. Yeah. Yep. Um, so when did you first kind of establish the Tool Barn? Well, let me see. We opened as the Jonesport Wood Company in West Jonesport in 1970. Uh, then in about um, 1974, I bought Liberty Tools. And then 1983, I bought this place and moved here from West Jonesport. Okay. Yeah. 83. 83. I've been here since 83. So you live here full time in Hulls Cove. You yeah, like please. living on the island. Oh, yeah. Um, and so what happens with the other tool uh, barn? Did somebody else run that too? Or that's. Well, um, in Jonesport, I ran Jonesport. And then, and then when we uh, purchased Liberty Tool and we opened Liberty in 1974, then um, we had helpers down here. And the so we been in business, uh, we started the 54th year. That's wild. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's shocking how fast time goes by, right? And it's... Don't get old. <laughs> so uh, were you always somebody that loved tools? I mean, what was your upbringing a little bit? Well, uh, I used to be an English teacher. Okay. And I think uh, writing books is my thing. So, like, what if, if a buyer or a seller wants to come here to kind of take a look at all the tools. Yeah. Um, like what, do you specialize in certain things or? Of everything. Yeah. Well, of course we like woodworking tools. So maybe our specialty is woodworking tools. There's those dogs with planes. If you look in there, you see all the planes from the window of the bar and the parts of the And of course, have you been upstairs yet? Yep, yeah, we checked out upstairs. It is some, is it to the point where some people just like the almost like it's a, a, a museum in a sense upstairs? I mean, do people go just to see a lot of customers are buying stuff they're going to use? They will, yeah. They, maybe five percent are buying things to hang on the wall. Yep. So we like our customers who uh, want to use the tool. Sure. Um, and then if, just for other folks that want to know um, more about when they can come here, is there it, it, it's it's open sometimes by appointment. Well, I would say seven days a week, but call ahead during the week. Yes. So I'll make sure I'm here. But I'm, unless I have to go to the doctor or something, I'm here seven days a week. So. You'll come in and open it up and let yeah. people take a look but around. Generally, you know, 1030 to 430, people think, not every day. And uh, well, customers would have to come up the back door and ring the bell, and I'll, I'll tell them what to do. Sure.
pretty good vibe for a change. What was it? Blueberry tank? Yeah, blueberry. First contest, kid? <laughs> Follow me. This is Alka-Seltzer. Gets rid of that stuffy feeling. When you've been on the circuit as long as I have, you'll know. See you around, kid. Next time you overeat, take what the guys who overeat for a living take. Alka-Seltzer. Hey, we're back here with Skip Brack. And Skip not only has the Tool Barn, which is like a main establishment, everybody knows it, and it's also Liberty Tools. Yeah, Liberty Tools. And, uh, but you're also a well-known publisher and writer, uh, written a lot of books over the years. Yeah. Um, as some of them are about tools, but I think some also are some interesting things that you have some knowledge about, like seismology, radiation, things like that. Um, but did you want to talk about some of these tool books that were pretty interesting? Well, let me see, I think my favorite book is publication of my best, one of my best selling books is this book, uh, Nora Vigas Reconsidered, the Wolstrom and the Walling on Tias, where that's about the Native Americans who lived here. Uh, and then the French came and the English came and that sort of thing. And that's uh, a lot of history in this book. Yeah, that's super cool. So I think that's my favorite yeah. publication. It goes through all kinds of stuff about uh, Native Americans and the history. Uh, and if you, yeah, probably not. If you want to turn the the book right to the camera guy, he'll the front of it. There you go. Get a nice shot of it. Yeah. And so, I'm curious about this. Does this again? Is this specialize in your uh, knowledge of tools in the sense that you were talking about what the Native Americans were using for the more you know quote unquote primitive tools to build yeah, things? Some or? some information on that. But, yeah. But if you look in the uh, uh, history of the Molotian community. Yeah. And, uh, and all the local history. Well, and the interesting thing is, is were, were uh, you know, tribes and things like that, did they necessarily need as many tools? Because when you're traveling around and you're yeah. kind of living off the land, maybe you're less dependent on tools because of the... Well, every community had the specialized tools they needed, but of course, uh, many of the uh, uh, of the relate to the fishery of the maritime, you know. To stuff that ke kept yeah. them going. And were a lot of the Native Americans, were they, when you're saying the maritime, were a lot of them trying to always be close to the water because that's where oh, the yeah. fishing was? Yeah. And it's interesting now, even in modern days, uh, like real estate is always more expensive by the water. And yeah. I, I feel like that's just something yeah. that's been like that since the beginning because that's if you're near the water, it's where, where you know, uh, it fish and yep. and uh, you know, and it's easier to get to uh, irrigating things yep. with the water from it. For example, um, Mount Desert Island was settled by the uh, French and then the English uh, in the 1750s. Okay. Maybe some French settlers before that, but then the English came. So a lot of history there. And then the Rockefeller came and yeah. made the park, and it became the playground for the wealthy. And it seemed like it got more relaxed of a place, but now in the past few years, it's become very uh, hoity-toity again in the time of, it, uh, I think a lot of people, we talked to the Auto Museum uh, during COVID, I think a lot of people decided they wanted to be, to getting to vacations where they could drive. Yeah. Less people were going to Hawaii or Europe. Uh, so they came more to places like Maine and it got very popular here and, and it, it's still pretty popular. And then there's a handbook of iron works. That looks very cool. And this is something that people would be very interested in. They're in blacksmiths. Uh, that's cool. Yep. Glossary of famous metallurgy terms. And then this was steel and tool making strategies. So this is a lot of history books yep. that are definitely good for the so it's really, tool buffs. I think our specialty could be described as uh, the history of tool making. History of tool making yeah. in all of civilization, or specifically a lot in America. Wow! Yeah, Some of the tools. that is interesting to see how tools have evolved. Ancient tool making techniques, the origin of metal. 
Yeah. Operate with the modern technology. And you kind of learn how, how yeah. all of history existed through the existence of tools. Yeah. And you found the tools in the old days. That makes sense. And archaeology almost in that too. Yeah. And then this last one here, or you got two more, I think. Uh, yeah, this yeah. is our most recent publication. And it's an iconography of the American hand tool. So, so this would tell you the different kinds of tools that were yeah. made, crochets and broad okay. eyes, and chisels, caulking iron. Yeah, look at that, it's very cool. And you can see some of these, a lot of them in the tool barn itself. Yeah. That's very cool. And you can find again on Amazon. Yeah. Well, all of these are available. All of them. And then this last one here was the Registry of Maine Toolmakers. Oh, if we're concentrating in the tools in Maine, this is the definitive uh, publications and stuff. And here's the listings that we made. You know, if you, if you see that A.D. Brown. Yeah. Well, he was working in 1855. He made shovels. Well, nothing too interesting, but still, we have. That's the. And how did you find, yeah, how, and did, this was extensive research to see all the tool makers, and you said in Maine specifically. Yeah. That's, it's a great history to show. Yeah, yeah. Maine tool makers. Yep, when all of the people tool makers. from way back when, yeah. That's been my specialty. Your specialty. Well, Maine tool makers. Well, if you get out to the tool barn, you've got to say hi to Skip and Judy. Check this place out this summer. Judith. Judith as well. Uh, thank you so much, Skip. Okay, well. It's good to see you, sir. And I'll be back here, but we'll be right back after this break. Thanks a lot. เลือดตึงเจ้าโคเลือดตึงเจ้าโคว่าถอยเลือดแมงมึงเหล่าเซ่ว่าเลือดเจ้าเนี่ยปากว่าเลือดจะเห่าแซ่เลือดเทวะเ
bay Watching while you're sleeping Always takes my breath away Good on you. It ain't the get up you got on makes me feel this way. When I wrap my eyes around you, girl, here's what I gotta say. We've got a beautiful film crew here tonight. Yeah, keep rolling. I'd love to thank Luigi for coming down. Yeah. And his crew of masters is looking for that. Uh, like I said, I got a brand new album out. We're going to do try out a few new tunes from it. Hope you enjoy them. And if you if you do listen to music somewhere, uh, the name is Buck T. Edwards. And uh, anywhere you stream music, you'll find about 10 albums.
back. Here's one for lovers and lovers at heart. Sipping margaritas at a roadside cantina. Swapping jokes at the bar with a sweet senorita. Listen to me If you don't get it by midnight You ain't gonna get it And even if you get it It's probably not worth it If you're trying to figure it out You better forget it Cause if you don't you ain't gonna get it. So I sat right back on my bar stool and I started thinking Was I falling for her or just feeling the drinks I was drinking? Why Buck always ends his shows by 11.30. Danger excites me, but I can't fully enjoy it when I spill like fear and body odor. So I prepare myself with a manly scent of Old Spice Danger Zone. Because even if something bad does happen to a Danger Zone man, it won't smell like something bad happened. Because the secret to smelling careless is... And when you smell like Old Spice Danger Zone, trust me, You'll smell like you have nothing to worry about. You smell like you look amazing. Amazing, I know. Introducing Old Spice Danger Zone with all-day odor protection. She's 
driving in her pickup truck, cruising across the Texas plain, through the cactus and the tumbleweeds, playing such a wicked game. She's driving in her pickup truck, splashing through the wind and rain, out searching for the man she loved. Put a bullet in his brain. Caught him cheap. Again one night with Rosalita, girl from the bar. So she went and got her 45, but she didn't get that far. She's driving in her pickup truck, cruising across the Texas plain. Through the cactus and the tumbleweeds Playing such a wicked game She's driving in her pickup truck Splashing through the wind and rain Out searching for the man she loved Put a bullet in his brain Let's go, Scotty! With him out El Paso away, dealing poker in a red dirt saloon. They say she smiled when she pulled the hammer back. Gun smoke filling up that room. She's driving in her pickup truck, cruising across the Texas plain. Through the cactus and the tumbleweeds, playing such a wicked game. Driving in her pickup truck, splashing through the wind and rain. Out searching for the man she loved, put a bullet in his brain. One more time, Scotty. Across the Texas plain, Woo! through the cactus and the tumbleweed, playing such a wicked game. She's driving in a pickup truck, cruising through the Texas plain, out searching for the man she loved. been a privilege and a pleasure. We got one more for you here, a little rock and roll tune, and it's a song about you. About me. For you. Here we go.
Yes, I thought it was real. So I played the fool while you played the field. I guess I was hurt when I found out the truth. So I sat down and wrote this song about. Just a pride. I wrote a song about you. Thought I'd forget about what you put me through. I'm not ashamed, and I'm not feeling blue. And I guess we'll go on with my song about you. We had some good times, or so it seems. You were all mine, then you crushed all my dreams. Thought it was love, yes, I thought it was real. So I played the fool while you played the field. I guess I was hurt when I found out the truth. something new to rock out with this is it the 1970 442 with 455 cube v8 engine standard order it with the new w25 package and you get it all fiberglass hood with air grabbing scoops locking hood pins super wide wheels bucket seats first shifter dual exhaust wouldn't it be nice if you had a 442 Escape from the ordinary. It's our show, folks. I want to thank Skip at the Tool Barn. As well as Buck Edwards and the folks at the Steel Cove Auto Museum. Have a great weekend. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next week.